Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story, where the wolves walk upright. There is a place in the backwoods of the high country where there aren't any towns or villages. It's too remote for all, but the most rugged of settlers. For those who dare to venture into the dense wilderness of the frontier, they practice caution and security. No one hunts in the forest alone. It's not a very desirable location to be stranded in after the sun goes down. All of the locals know it. There's all manner of enchanted spirits and wild beasts haunting those woods after nightfall. And not all them are benevolent. The mysterious wolves which roam the forest and howl at the moon are said to traverse completely upright on their hind legs. From a distance, they supposedly bear a remarkable resemblance in the erect posture of human beings. Many hunters swear to have witnessed seeing those unnatural creatures lurking about. They are said to surround their prey in highly organized hunting packs, just like ordinary wolves. The primary difference being that they track and trap their prey from a seven-foot-tall, standing vantage point. Villagers in the nearby towns are a superstitious lot and took this sinister canine legend to heart. I never gave their fanciful folklore much credence until I saw one of the feral beasts for myself. It crept around an outlying cluster of hardwoods at the edge of the woods, near the faded light of dusk. My jaw dropped and the hairs on my neck raised up. As soon as it saw me, it wrinkled its snout in an aggressive, toothy snarl. I feared that I was going to have to fend off a violent attack, but in the end, it retreated away slowly. I'll never forget the startling sight of a fully standing werewolf, massive in size, stepping backward into the safety of the tree line. What black magic sorcery or mysterious act of the Lord was this? The fierce look in its coal-black eyes spoke volumes. You stay inside your territory and I'll stay within mine, was the message. Being so close to the wretched thing filled me with a chilling dread. Could I really trust that it and its brethren would hold true to the unspoken truce? I had no way of knowing but from that day forward. I forbade my children from stepping foot into the woods after sundown. Even the most obedient children are apt to misunderstand or not take parental warnings seriously. In the back of my mind, I always carried a lurking fear of the possible consequences. Naturally, my sons and daughters failed to understand the true reason for my strict, unexplained directive. I didn't even try to tell them about the horrible abomination I'd witnessed. Being labeled a forbidden place made it even more tantalizing. I caught all of them stealing longing glances at it from time to time. The devilish mystique of an unfamiliar territory was slowly seducing them. Each day the temptation wore down their resistance a little bit more. The greater the opposition I raised to the damned labyrinth of beckoning trees, the heavier their curiosity bore upon them. All too soon, the situation I dreaded came true. I awoke to find that my eldest two children couldn't resist the allure of the woods any longer. They had crept outside to explore it, apparently. Their beds were vacant, the candle box was missing, and the hen eggs were still uncollected from their chicken coo chores. Calling are their names at the edge of the woods proved futile. They had too much of a head start wandering the dense highlands. I gathered up my rifle and gunpowder pack for the unpleasant task ahead. An occasional drip of congealed wax upon fallen leaves confirmed their path. I was relieved to feel that it was still a bit warm to the touch. That was a sign they weren't too far ahead. By mid-morning, I had picked up and lost their trail several times. Other things were active along the well-worn deer path. 
The disturbed leaves and brush I found wasn't proof of their presence any longer. They would have blown out the melting candle with the full rise of the sun. From there, the wax trail went cold. I yelled and shouted their names until I was hoarse. Only a mocking echo bouncing off the nearby canyons answered me back. I considered doubling back to the last confirmed evidence of their trek, but an unknown force inside me kept pushing onward. In the blackest heart of the highlands, only wisps of sunlight can trickle down to the leaf-strewn floor below. I was deeper in the forest than I'd ever been into the dense wooded canopy. Suddenly, I felt a significant presence nearby. A dark entity was watching. I turned to face the same ferocious mongrel which had haunted my nightmares since the first day I saw it. This time the standing alpha leader of the pack wasn't alone. I was surrounded by a half-dozen other attackrity wolves. He snarled while the others remained silent in hierarchical respect. I had my gun at the ready, but could only take out one of them before the rest pounced on me. He was the obvious choice for my musket volley. When the leader of any rank and file organization falls, the underlings often panic. Regardless, I wasn't likely to make it out of the woods alive. I thought deeply about the circumstances which led me there. I had been the one who violated the agreement and broke the rules. I was in their territory. Against every instinct I held dear, I lowered my weapon as a sign of contrition. The posture of the pack immediately changed. The alpha male stepped back slightly. Then all the others followed suit, breaking the tense stalemate. Eventually they all fell back out of sight. To much greater surprise, my two missing children appeared from the same general direction. I surmised that the majestic wolves who walk upright had been holding them captive until I came to answer for their careless trespass. I was glad that I found a peaceful resolution to being cornered by them. I am sure there would have been a very different outcome otherwise. My children and I walked back home in virgin silence. No angry words needed to be spoken, nor threats made. I saw the mortal depth of fear and greater understanding in their remorseful eyes. Never again would I have to worry about them, or their younger siblings wandering into the highland woods. No doubt they would impart the importance of honoring the territorial border with my two youngest children. It was a valuable lesson for all of us. Second Story Who's afraid of a little werewolf? This story is actually real, though in the end everything turned out to have a fairly logical explanation, but I will get to that. It was about two years ago, I was about 21 at the time. That summer, a few friends and I would often go camping in the forest near our hometown. I have this old 1968 Chevy G, tin van which has been super reliable over the years, and we had started a kind of tradition of taking it along straight into the woods with us on our trips. It was really nice to have transportation close by, and we didn't have to carry our tents and camping supplies very far. Besides, my great Dane got scared easily, and walking him through a dark forest was more trouble than it was worth. We would roast hot dogs, tell stories, and generally just goof around. This particular night was the same as most weekends. The girls, Virginia and Diana, roasting some hot dogs. I was getting the tent set up. I bought this stupid folding tent for my dog, and he was in no help in putting it together. My best friend, Fred, was standing around talking and watching the food cook. Well, soon the hot dogs finished and man was I hungry. Right as we were about to eat, though, we heard this piercing howl. When it comes to supernatural stuff, let's just say over the years my friends and I have had more than our fair share. We often would stumble into these situations where things would just get really weird. So given our history on these trips, we all got a bit freaked out by this howl. Especially when we looked into the undergrowth nearby and saw a pair of eyes staring back. Diana suggested it was a wolf but we checked it out anyway against my wishes. Sure enough, we found the tracks of a wolf 
or large dock. The only problem? It was obvious that these tracks were made on two legs. Fred was the kind of guy who wanted to prove the supernatural with more zeal than I can believe, so he obviously suggested it was a werewolf. I didn't want to get into this situation, but next thing I know we are trudging through the woods looking for clues to where the dog, or whatever had gone. I still remember so well as the woods gave way to a foggy clearing, and through the mist I could make out a black iron fence with those spear point tips that you might see around a garden. In this case, it was around a cemetery. No problem. Hanging around Fred, I have been in my share of cemeteries and am not afraid of them outright. Still, I have to admit it was pretty creepy. The gnarled branches of the dead trees stuck out of the fog like skeletal hands grasping from the mists of the river Styx. Okay, maybe I was a little freaked out at this point, but it was about to get a lot worse. Next thing I know... I was staring down into an open grave and Fred was reading the headstone aloud. Here lies Silas Osterholt, half man, half wolf. Well, let's just say I was already half gone to get back to my van when Fred grabbed my shoulders. This is our first real clue. We can't leave now. I let him know that I wasn't about to follow the tracks leading away from the tombstone, which matched the ones near our campsite. Because if there was a werewolf zombie out there that had crawled out of this grave, I didn't want any part of it. I am not even sure they heard my protests, and as always we were off to solve this paranormal mystery. Fred had a way about him that just made you want to follow him, and against every instinct I pumped my legs in their direction as they continued to trek after this beast. We found more tracks and some mud further in the woods, and followed them to an old, run-down flour mill. The second we got to the doorway, another of those freaking howls started. I could feel it piercing to my bones, but they all decided the best course of action was to go in anyway. We are all smart people, especially Diana. But there we were walking into this crumbling flour mill chasing what was at best a large dog and at worst a werewolf from beyond the grave. It was clear this werewolf didn't have a maid. This place was covered in spider webs, dust, and would be best described as just generally gray. Soon enough, we were splitting up to explore the place. The ladies went with Fred. Me and my dog went off in the opposite direction. I figured since I didn't get to eat my hot dogs I could grab a snack while they searched the place. I figured if there were a wolf in here, we would hear it by now. Besides, this place actually seemed pretty cool. I found an old mask hanging on the wall. It looked African in origin. I decided to grab it and head back to find my pals. As I pulled it off the wall, I heard a thump behind me, but when I turned around there was nothing there. This obviously freaked me out. So I put the mask back and started jogging back in the direction of my friends. Well... This part of the story I got from Virginia later. Apparently, Fred had discovered more wolf tracks in the dust, leading straight into a wall. After doing a bit of searching, they found a switch that revealed a secret door, leading to a small room with a single table, a chair, and a map. The map was crude, showing the general layout of the forest. There were three X's drawn on the map, and one was labeled Mill. Just after finding it, Fred and the ladies came face to face with our wolf. It had less hair than you might expect, and its flesh was a rotten green color. It stood, as Fred had suggested, on two legs. They knocked down a stack of crates on the beast and booked it out of there. As I was coming back to tell them about the sweet mask and strange sounds, they ran straight into me and my pup, hitting the floor. I saw the thing's shadow approaching our corner. Things got real very fast. Next thing I know, my legs are going like rockets and my dog is right beside me. The others must have run a different direction, but the beast decided I was the more appetizing one and gave chase. I grabbed my dog and hid under a crate over a spot of particularly rotten floor. I kicked it through just as the monster found us, and my dog and I tumbled down to the next level of the building. 
I was so frantic I had no idea what to do, and my dog was being cowardly as ever, who could blame him? We ran up a set of nearby stairs, and my eyes fell to rest on a large water hose, the kind built into the walls of industrial mills like this one in case of fires. I turned that hose on the beast as it topped the stairs, knocking it straight back down them. I jumped onto a nearby ladder, dog over my shoulders, and climbed for my life. The thing was back up the stairs and I could see its red eyes glowing with what was certainly a sentient hatred. This thing wanted to kill me, and I wasn't going to wait around. As I reached the roof of the mill, I saw the thing start to climb the ladder. I did the only smart thing and hopped down to a lower section of the building that was directly over the water wheel. The wheel was not too big, and I could tell that if I could cross it I could get to a nearby window and hopefully ditch this creature which by now had reached the upper roof. The dog and I ran across the water wheel, which felt a lot like running on an unstable treadmill, and I grabbed him and jumped headfirst through that window. We ended up in some kind of storage room filled with bags of wool. I covered us in a pile of the stuff and hoped the thing didn't find me. Next thing I know, my friends walk in and mistake us for monsters as we start crawling out of the wool to greet them. Before I can get it out of my mouth to stop them, they took off running, again, and so I ran after to find them. They were hiding in freaking barrels that had these weird rubber tubes sticking out of the top like snorkels. I knew they were there because the tubing was shaking around with their movements. They are lucky it was me looking and not the wolf thing. Diana noted all the things that were suspicious here. Secret room, the map, the wool, the barrels with rubber tubing, and obviously the werewolf slash zombie slash ghost thing. Fred said he was determined to get to the bottom of it and set off for the exit. We headed out some shipping doors in the back and found a set of railway tracks that lead from a nearby storage building to a dock on the river with an empty cart rolling by us down to the water. This was most likely originally to haul out flour produced by the mill, but this mill had been out of service quite a while by the look of it. I want to check out where the tracks went, while my friends want to see where the tracks originated. I followed the cart and came upon an old, rusty shipping barge. Some king of very large storage container on the barge opened to accept the cart as I got close. I heard a sound behind me and through the fog saw as the monster threw a large barrel straight at my head. It missed by a couple feet and landed just behind me, so I jumped as it rolled under me. I landed on the barrel and ran on it for about two seconds as it rolled. Probably the most skillful balancing act I have ever pulled off. I grabbed a hook from a ship-to-shore loading crane and swung like freaking Tarzan, scooping my dog up. I must have looked like Indiana Jones or something, but I honestly don't normally have that kind of skill. Funny what you can do when adrenaline is pumping. That heroism ended fast as I slammed into a small shack on the shore. Running inside, I found a basement area down a ladder, so down I went, heavy dog on my back. I followed a tunnel I found and hoped it would lead to my friends. As all this was going on, they had been following the tracks in the other direction. I heard them talking above me as they searched, and I knew my tunnel was directly under them. I walked below their feet until I found a ladder and popped up on them. I told them about what I found, the electric barge that opened to catch the carts. For whatever reason, they didn't believe me. I took them back through the tunnel and showed them in person. A cart approached, and a section of the barge opened just as before. The cart went in, and so did we. Inside was a room full of those strange barrels with the rubber tubing. Soon enough, we also saw the monster. He was outside this section of the ship, fishing one of those strange barrels out of the river. He carried it inside and placed it on the newly arrived cart. I was sure I could hear a sheep from inside the barrel. Fred decided that he wanted to capture the beast, and in order to catch him, we would need to get inside the next barrel as it came down the river. 
They were planning to use the crane hook, the one from my heroic escape earlier which they also didn't believe, to catch the beast when I popped out of the barrel, but obviously such a stupid plan didn't work out. Instead, I just pushed my barrel back into the river after the crane inevitably missed the mark and hoped the thing didn't eat me. It started giving chase in a small raft that was on the barge. At this point, it was clear that this thing was as smart as a human. It was also clear that this river gave way to a waterfall very soon. My loyal but terrified pup jumped into the water and pulled me out just before the falls. The werewolf wasn't so lucky. His raft snagged on a rock just as he went over the falls and he began yelling, in English, for help. We pulled him up from the bank and found that he was just a man in a mask. In fact, he wasn't a werewolf. He was a thief and smuggler. He was using the old mill to move stolen livestock and used the costume to frighten off anyone who came along out here. They would float the stolen livestock and stolen goods from further up the river and he would catch the barrels and ship them out to the black stock market or wherever you sell stolen livestock. Sure, it didn't turn out to be paranormal. I have to say, though, this was one of the more frightening camping trips I have taken. Third story. Halloween with a werewolf. I live in a small village in rural England. It's a sleepy little place, but for all that it has a quite a rich history. There's an old castle some ways away that was owned by a feudal lord in the Middle Ages, and legends about the castle and the surrounding countryside about. My favorite legend is the one about the Lord and his illicit lady lovers. It's a great story of guilt, revenge, and adventure, and I don't believe a word of it. My friend Sam, on the other hand, his favorite story is the one about the wolf. Legend has it that over 300 years ago, the Lord's eldest son was out hunting when he was set upon by a monstrous hound. It knocked the boy from his horse, crippling him on impact, and then fled into the woods. The Lord's men who had been accompanying the boy had chased after it, with just one man staying behind to guard the lad. When the Lord's men returned to the spot where the accident took place, having failed to locate the wolf, there was no one there. Neither lad nor soldier, just a trail of blood and signs of a struggle. The young man was never seen again after that point. But ever since, there have been rumors and whispers of a midnight black wolf that haunts the full moons of our quaint little countryside. It's just a story but Sam, he believes it. He loves the story, and he loves the imagery of the wolf. One Halloween Sam decided to dress up as the wolf from the legend. He was really excited because this Halloween was actually going to occur on a full moon as well. Now I know what you're thinking. Clearly this story will end up with me, mistaking the real werewolf for Sam in his costume at some point. How cliché. Let me assure you that that did not happen. It couldn't have. Sam's costume was good, don't get me wrong. But it wasn't good enough to mistake for the werewolf from the story. It wasn't bulky enough, and the mask, which was really just a motorcycle helmet with lots of cardboard and fake fur all over it, wasn't expressive or lively enough for that. The rest of his costume was alright I guess. He had gotten a lot of dark clothing and covered every part of it in fake fur. Honestly, he really had gone to a lot of effort with the whole thing. What really impressed me was the attention to detail he had used. The cardboard teeth had little droplets of blood painted onto them. He had a tail made from a wire brush that he'd made look pretty authentic and he walked around in a hunched manner, like he was some bizarre, lupin homunculus, struggling with the beast that lay within him. It was obvious that it was a costume, but you had to hand it to him. The costume did look like a werewolf ought to look. It sort of put me off my lunch to be honest. I mean it really is quite weird when you eat someone who looks so much like yourself. Fourth story. I didn't believe in werewolves but I spent years hunting one who wept. His face streaked with tears. He writhed in his seat. His legs stretched, 
bare ankle appeared below his jeans. His shirt pulled loose, his back hunching, his head pressed to my car's roof. I saw claws, sharp and heavy, slide from beneath his fingernails. Underneath his face, the bones shifted shape. The brow rose and sloped, the lower jaw lengthened front and rear. Muscles bulged in his face, telling of terrible power in his bite. I'd been hunting for the so-called werewolf who killed my sister. Now he was in my passenger seat, and I had only seconds to decide what to do. One August evening four years ago, my sister, Ginger Ames, died at the Square Diner in Drunken Tree. The coroner ruled her death accidental. She fell on broken glass when people were running away in panic. Even if that was true, I still blamed the bastard who started the panic. The man who killed Ginger was described as about 5 foot 10 to 6 foot. Wavy dark blonde hair loose to his shoulders, clean shaven, brown eyes, no scars. 20 people there, but no photos, that's panic for you. Ordinary looking. Except when he was 7 feet tall and had claws he could sheath like a cat's. That description's from the man who served his burger and fries. Just before he started crying, grew a foot taller, and started killing people. This fall, a man named Robert Souter was torn open in the parking lot of the same diner. His friend Carrie White said they'd been discussing Ginger's death. Souter had been a witness that night. Another man, Jacob Evers, had been with Carrie and Souter. She dated Evers several times. She introduced Evers to Souter. They all had dinner together, but she left before they did. Souter was found dead in the parking lot. Evers hasn't been seen since. Jacob Evers was described as 5'9 to 6 foot, hazel eyes, bald, full blonde beard. Ordinary looking, aside from the whiskers. Carrie White said he had no scars or tattoos anywhere she'd had opportunity to see. Police said the name is probably false. Four years ago, right after Ginger's funeral, I met with Leanne Gross. Leanne had been Ginger's lover for about a year. A few months before Ginger was killed, they quietly split up, but they'd remained close friends and talked frequently. Now I learned that Leanne spoke to Ginger the night she was killed. She called me, asked if Travis had come by. They talked all the time, you know? I knew. Travis Mosley and Ginger had been best friends since our Jenna Junior High, closer than siblings. Though I was a couple of years younger, he'd been my friend, too, as much as anybody so bottled up could be. Travis was a stoic, never betraying hurt or anger. Though he had a warm grin, he only rarely showed excitement or affection. Only Ginger could open him up. All our parents expected them to get married. Then they both announced they were gay, the same week. That had rattled me. I'd never had a gay friend before, didn't know how to take it. But when I saw how he stuck by Ginger during our parents' first angry, frightened reactions, I realized I owed him the same loyalty. He disappeared for a while, earlier that summer. When he reappeared, he claimed not to know where he'd been. Ginger was the only one who really believed him. Even his parents thought he was hiding something. I didn't know what to believe. I backed him because Ginger did. Now Leanne told me that Ginger and Travis had planned to meet at the Square Diner. Ginger had called Leanne because Travis was late and hadn't called her. Leanne said, Ginger thought maybe he'd come by here to get her, not remembering we split up. I toyed with the idea that Travis was the werewolf. Travis was the right size and build, a bit under six feet, and blonde. All the descriptions called the guy ordinary looking until he changed. And Travis was the complete guy next door. Ordinary as oatmeal, except for two stark scars on his chin and cheek from a bicycle wreck. I was ashamed for even considering him. Travis, crying in public? Laughable. And I absolutely couldn't believe he'd hurt Ginger. He'd have died first. Travis hadn't come to Ginger's funeral, though, 
a real shock. He'd holed up in his parents' house in Argenta, absolutely crushed by her death. I'd gone by to visit and found him sitting in a darkened bedroom. Though glad to see me, at first he'd hardly talk. When he did, his voice was flat. It's like a curse. First I lose a month, then I lose Ginger. Something happens to mom and dad. No way I could stand that. I'd just die. I'd never heard that much emotion from him. A week or two later, he took off, closed his apartment, stored his stuff, and left town. He called his parents every week or two, but never told them where he was. He turned off friend tracking on his phone. I didn't see him for four years. About the time Travis left, I talked to the server in the diner. Only a few weeks after Ginger's funeral, Marcus Alderigio's story was already well rehearsed. Aldo, said Ginger, and this blonde-haired fellow came in together. The man started crying. I thought she was giving him the dear John, said Aldo. He started crying. Then he changed. I was closer than anybody else, Aldo said. Right across the counter. I could see tears dripping off his chin. I can tell you, he didn't sprout hair or big fangs. None of that. But his bones changed. When he stood up, he was over seven foot. And he had claws like a cat that he could sheathe or pop out. A lady screamed. But the real panic didn't start until some working class hero type tried to wrestle the cat man to the ground. He eviscerated the idiot. When guts hit the floor, the diner went crazy. Less than a minute later, Ginger was dying, her belly ripped by glass. She bled to death before paramedics arrived. The coroner found bruises on her back, from feet. Hating myself, I showed Aldo a photo of Travis on my phone. Small as the image was, he immediately picked out the facial scars. Same kind of face, real John Doe type, but this guy didn't have so much as an acne scar. Perfect skin. Two days after Suter's murder, I talked again to Aldo. Before he'd say a word, I had to remind him I was Ginger's brother, and that we talked four years earlier. But he wasn't much help regarding Jacob Evers. I told the cops, I don't know if it's the same guy. I couldn't pick either one of them out of a decent lineup. They got that kind of face. Joe Average face, no scars, no tattoos, just that beard. I'd recognize this guy's voice again. Maybe, we talk that much, but his face? Could be anybody. At least this time I could be sure it wasn't Travis, since Jacob had slept with Carrie White. Some small comfort. How do you find a werewolf? Or werecat? The cops thought it was some sort of stunt, and were checking all of Ginger's acquaintances. They'd investigated Travis, too, but I still felt guilty. In four years, while I was in college, they found no leads on the diner killer. Now, with Robert Souter, there'd been another killing. They wouldn't say whether they thought it was the same killer. But either way, they weren't looking for a shapeshifter with cat claws. I was. A shapeshifter who cried. My granddad used to say of someone, he was raised breathing drunken tree lake. He meant that people who move to the area don't have the same attitudes as people who grew up here. And people who grew up in town don't have the same attitudes as those who lived along the shore or in the hills. Things happen around here. Sometimes people make things happen. This fall, after wondering for four years about Ginger's death, I wanted to make something happen. I looked up a lady who'd been my grandmother's friend when I was little and asked her what she remembered about Ginger's death. If she blamed it on drugs, like the newspapers, I'd have visited a while and gone home. But she said, that was a terrible thing. And that creature's still around, somewhere. You heard he killed another man last week? When I told her what I wanted, she warned. Some of those folks can be as dangerous as the thing that killed Ginger. You should keep your distance from them. I told her I had to find the cat man, whatever it took. You're fixing to do it anyway, she said finally, 
So I suppose I ought to steer you to the right people. Let me ask about, see who's still walking this earth. I left my number. A week later she called me. There's a man named Yuri White, lives on Grace Mountain, Jackson Road. He won't do anything, but he'll put you in touch. She read me a number. Yuri White, Jackson Road. Mr. White to you. He's uppish that way. Mr. White refused to talk on the phone or invite me to his home. I'll meet you at the old Second Baptist, downtown Argenta. You know it? Across from Guthrie Park? That's it. I'll be there at three to meet someone else. If you come, we'll talk. I'll have a black necktie. Guthrie Park is a square block on JFK. Crossing the park to Second Baptist Church, I spotted a broad-shouldered bald guy with a blonde beard, maybe 40, leaning against a historic marker, gazing up at the church. I tensed, then relaxed. Since Souter was killed, I'd been clenching up at every bald, bearded blonde I saw. The little church had closed down, I discovered. A sign said it would soon be a neighborhood resource center. Inside, several young people in jeans and t-shirts worked at scrubbing and painting concrete block walls. The color of Mr. White's tie was irrelevant. Nobody else even had a collar. He was a tall, thin man, perhaps in his late sixties, with thick snow-white hair and a narrow mustache. I briefly told Ginger's story. I want to find him, I said. Landy said you knew people. Perhaps. Have you heard of the Coterie? The what? No, sir. Good. You shouldn't have. And it would be good if no one heard of them from you. He smiled thinly. One of them is likely to have the required skill. And this sort of case often interests them. He stooped toward me. They will expect a substantial payment. Are you prepared to pay? I remembered standing by Ginger's grave, sweating in my best suit. If I can afford it, sir, I'll pay whatever it takes. The bearded guy still stood looking at the church. His eyes flicked to me as I came out, looked away, then came back more sharply. Rick? He said. The voice rang bells, but the face didn't. Saudi? He grinned, obviously unsurprised at my lack of recognition. Even with a beard, that grin was familiar and took 15 years off him. I looked at the tanned scalp, the whiskered jaw. Travis? Hey man, how you been? He'd grown thin since I'd last seen him. The broad shoulders only emphasized that. And that bare scalp? Cancer? But there was a robustness to him that belied that thought. Clean, I thought, then couldn't think why. Where the hell have you been? It just burst out. He'd been such a part of Ginger's life, then he'd fallen off the earth. Before he answered, he walked right up and put his arms around me. I returned his embrace somewhat hesitantly and used to such display from him. He stepped back and looked me over. I've been kind of messed up, he said. I lost more in a month of my life, and I'm still hunting for it. You still don't know how? Jesus, your mom must have called Ginger 200 times while you were missing, asking had she heard from you. Where have you been since? Around. You'd V.E. seen me, but I hear you went to Texas A&M. He punched me on the shoulder. Traitor. I had to get away. After Ginger, I couldn't stay home. Compared to Arkansas, Texas is like a foreign goddamn country. Yeah, Ginger messed me up, too. I spent so much time trying to find out what happened to her. Me too, whenever I came home. You believe in this werewolf shit? Not one goddamn bit. His jaw clenched. I believe in plain old human fuckery. That's more than enough. Listen, I, uh, I've got to get to the bank. Are you at your mom's house? We should talk, compare notes. Maybe between us we've got all the pieces. He cocked his head. You mean you've actually found out something? I must have talked to a hundred people who said they were there that night, 
and not more than ten of them were for real. I think I've got a lead, at least, but I really have to get across town. You carry a phone, right? I sent him a text, so we had each other's numbers. I was in line at the bank when my phone rang. $2,000, Mr. White told me. 500 in advance, for our expenses. 1500 if and when we find him. If we can't, we don't bill you. I whistled softly. That's a lot. This requires more than a Craigslist ad, Mr. Ames. Our techniques can be dangerous, even when we aren't seeking a known killer. Earlier he'd said they, not we. How fast do you need the five? Please have it by this evening. Somebody will come for it. She'll call herself Kite. Free spirit, huh? No, Mr. Ames. A very efficient hunter. She couldn't have been 16 yet, skinny and coltish, but she scared me. When I opened my door, she stood on my porch, twitching like an open switchblade. The sunset flamed against her strawberry blonde hair. I'm Kite. I'd have sooner invited a hooded cobra into my apartment, but she slipped in before I could protest. I had the urge to check my ribs for slashes. I gave her a $500 cashier's check, and she gave me a receipt. We'll keep Mr. White informed. When she was gone, I drew a deep breath and felt myself shuddering. Our techniques can be dangerous, Mr. White had said. She was scary as hell but seemed like she'd be fast and efficient. I had no idea how fast things were about to move. In two hours, I'd know nearly everything. Fifteen minutes after Kite left, someone knocked. My heart pounding, fearful she'd returned. I opened the door. Travis stood there. The sunset had already faded. Thin, hairless, his beard grayed in the twilight, he looked like the ghost of Travis yet to come. Hey man, he said softly. Your mom told me where you live. This a good time to talk? Yeah, sure. Come on in. Don't like talking inside. How about we go for a drive around the lake? I started to protest, but something in his face stopped me. There was a look of tremendous calm, even peace about him. But it was the peace of someone who has swallowed an enormous pain, certain of his capacity to absorb it. Yeah, sure, I said again. Let me go pee and grab a drink. Driving north through the marina district, we exchanged news about our families. Our parents, his grandfather, my older brother Gary in Atlanta. Not until we hit the quiet, dark, tree-flanked roads of Grace Mountain, did our talk turn to Ginger. I summarized what I'd learned over the years, though I didn't admit showing his photo to Aldo. He listened intently, without commenting. At the end he said, Well, it's too bad. But you ain't got anything I didn't already have. But he didn't seem disappointed. In fact, he seemed almost relieved. I asked him what he knew that I didn't. I don't know, he said. I don't know if you're ready to hear some of it. What? Travis, that's not fair. She's my sister. But I watched his face close, growing distant. I realized something. Travis had been trying to open up with me as he had with Ginger. But I wasn't Ginger, and in the end he couldn't trust me that far. It hurt, but I resolved not to show it. So I realized something about myself. I was trying to be like Travis, stoic and strong. Before he came out, I'd have never guessed that a gay man would one day be my role model for tough. And a final revelation. Four years at A&M hadn't taught me anything about dealing with death. Though older than Ginger had been when she died, I was still a kid, asking the grown-ups for help. We were winding down Grace Mountain Road less than a minute from the center of Drunken Tree. To circle the lake, we'd turn east toward Shore Road, right past the Square Diner. I'd been by it often, small as Drunken Tree is, to avoid the diner you'd have to avoid the whole town, but tonight Ginger's memories were strong. I signaled a right turn. 
my grip painfully tight on the wheel. There in the bright lights, people sat eating supper. Well, if you won't help me, I said, somebody else will. I've been talking to people. They think they can find the guy with the claws. I stopped, embarrassed to say more. Who the hell told you that? Don't snap it, sorry. I just feel so damn silly saying it. They're witches. You know the stories around here. Witchcraft, covens up in the hills. They can find things cops can't. He sucked in sharply. You were at the church. Who was it? People called the coterie. They say they can help. Oh, Christ, Rick, are you crazy? They're dangerous. How the hell did you even hear of the coterie? I asked around. Old folks, you know the people I could ask. The village fell behind us. From here to the dam, Shore Road was woodland and houses on large private tracts, with a few shoreside developments. The old money lived here, north of the lake. Oh, Jesus, you don't know who you're messing with. Did any of them give you a name? A girl named Kite. Just a kid. Oh shit, oh Christ. Those people will kill you if you screw with them. Why the hell did you go to them? I started to cry, blurring my headlights on the curves. I loved her so much, I choked out. But she trusted you. I was just the little pest brother. His face worked. Shit, no man. She was hella proud of you. Aggie scholarship and all that? She talked about you all the... He broke off. By passing headlights, I saw tears glisten in his eyes. And I saw something else. His beard covered his chin and his jawline. But not his upper cheeks. Clean. I'd thought in Guthrie Park and wondered why. The beard had confused me, but the white scar was gone from his left cheek. Without thinking, I pressed the gas. In moments I was going over fifty, rural mailboxes flashing past. I couldn't ask the question in my mind. Who are you? Instead I asked, why were you late? If you got there on time, you could have protected her. He groaned. I was there. I tried to protect her. I glanced at him. He'd squeezed his eyes tight, fighting the tears streaming down his face. He started crying, Aldo said. Then he changed. As Travis changed now. My friend my sister's best friend, changed into something I couldn't explain. I pressed the gas harder. If I went fast enough, maybe he wouldn't dare attack. I whipped around a curve, tires squalling. Claws sprang out to grip my dash. His growls laid a ghastly bass line beneath my shrieking tires. If he attacked me, or if I found the courage... I would slam my car's passenger side against one of the huge old hickories flashing by. Would it kill him? Even hurt him? Crazily, I thought of the times I'd considered having a silver-bladed knife made, just for this scene. This confrontation with my sister's killer, I came out of a curve half sideways and fought the car back into its lane. I knew Shore Road, but not at this speed. I glanced toward Travis. He sat braced in his seat, lips drawn back, jaws clenched. His voice was thick, guttural. Rick, please slow down. I shot past a westbound pickup at 80. You killed her. You got her killed. My own voice was tight, raised just over the road noise. He terrified me, but so did my speed. A tree appeared on the right, very near the road. I tried to twitch the wheel toward it, but my arms wouldn't obey, or obeyed a deeper command. I didn't hurt her, he growled, a voice from the pit. Another man killed her, on purpose. You gotta believe me. Now a ditch ran along the road's right side. I'd missed my chance with trees over there. Tall poles for high tension lines were flashing by on the left, shining in moonlight, too far from the road. Then I remembered the bridge over Possum Walk Creek. A short stretch to accelerate, a quick twitch to the right, and a concrete post would tear off everything behind my right headlight. 
He must have seen my eyes change as the bridge came into sight. As I floored the gas, he leaped at me, roaring. My last hesitation overcome, I turned squarely toward the bridge pillar. One clawed hand snatched at the wheel, tearing a gash across my raised arm. The other grabbed the transmission lever and chunked it into neutral. The engine screamed, racing. For a frantic half-second we fought the wheel. I heard a hard bam and tearing sounds. Then we shot off the far end of the bridge and slid sideways into a chain-link fence. The car reared onto its side, and Travis fell on me. I couldn't move, pinned by his arms. I waited for the claws to rip into me, and waited. Are you done? Travis rumbled. If you are, we need to get out of here. Somebody'll call the cops. He pulled himself off of me, up into the passenger seat. Wedging himself there, he shoved his weight back and forth, rocking the car against the fence. After three or four well-timed shoves, the car toppled, whamming down onto four wheels. Amazingly, the engine was still running. By feel, not taking my eyes off him, I shifted into reverse, pulled away from the fence, then pulled forward to swing onto the pavement. He opened his door and stepped out. I'll find you, I said. You can't get. Don't be a dweeb, he said, startling me into silence. I'm just gonna check the car. He walked around. I heard, holy crap, followed by the creak of metal and crackle of plastic. Turn around, go back to the bridge. We gotta pick up your bumper before some poor dumbass runs over it. Hardly believing myself, I did as he said. My rear bumper lay half across the road. With arms unnaturally long, he picked it up, opened my rear door, and wedged it into my back seat. That's gonna cost you some. He climbed into the front, bending almost double to fit. Not a mark on the right side, until just behind the rear wheel. A foot further back, Uday missed the post completely. Six inches forward, Uday lost the wheel. He pointed east. Turn around. Drive. I drove. I could never hurt you, Rick, he said. He shook his head. I didn't hurt Ginger, either. She was safe, or should have been. Fresh tears in his eyes, he told me the true story of how Ginger died. I only interrupted once to exclaim, You slept with Carrie White, just to find someone she knew. Yeah. I'm not proud of that, but I would have done worse to find that guy. When it was over, I should have had a thousand questions, but I only had three. When I saw you tonight, I thought you looked, well, peaceful. Is that why? Because you got the truth about Ginger? Peaceful? Oh man, I wish. But yeah, I feel better than I have for a long time. You haven't said, how do you change back? Start laughing? I guess to him it was a chuckle. It sounded like a bulldozer breaking up pavement. I wish. No, it's what you said first. I gotta get peaceful. I have to let go of myself. That bulldozer sound again. It's as hard as letting myself cry. I'm too uptight, even when I ought to relax. I couldn't think of but one answer for that. I pulled into the folk damn parking lot put the car in park, and walked around to his door. Get out, I said. He frowned up at me, but then clambered out, standing up, and up and up. I hugged him, something I hadn't done since we were kids. It was weirdly like being ten years old again, when he was twelve and sprouting like a chinaberry tree. My head rested on his chest. I've got you, I told him now, just for a little while. Let me hold on to everything for you. First, he cried. Then a car passed, and he gave a soundless laugh. We look like a fine couple, I bet. And finally, I felt the tension go out of his back, out of his chest. Stand back, he hissed. From a pace away, I watched him shrink to the Travis Mosley I knew. He drew a deep breath of the cold night air, 
and grinned a familiar grin. Warm but shallow, he was already rebuilding his walls. I knew now they held a door for me, as they had for Ginger. I asked my last question, why were you at Second Baptist? I already suspected the answer. I was following a woman. I think she's coterie, but I don't think she knows about me. She's a witch, I'm pretty sure, but not all the coterie are bad. I want information, and I think she'll talk to me. He jerked his head at the car. We climbed back in. You know I lost a month. By now, you can guess that's when this happened to me. When I became, whatever the hell I am. Not a work cat, even with those claws. All stretched out like that. You're about as cat-like as a blue heron. Were giraffe? He laughed. A nice normal laugh. Let's stick with werewolf. The laugh stopped. That's when I was changed. And now I'm pretty sure who did it. The coterie made me a werewolf. We reached the Taylor Branch Bridge below the dam. He looked up at the glaring lights and the high concrete wall. And that makes the coterie the bastards that got Ginger killed. We drove south toward home. His face as hard as folk dam. Fifth story. I saw a goddamn werewolf. That shit was terrifying. Or I think I did. So I guess you all know about werewolves. I mean seriously, if you never ever have heard about one, you must be living under a rock. A really big one. I need to confess you guys what I saw because this is crazy. I don't even know if what I saw was real or my imagination, but was it creepy? So me and my wife both agreed to go on a holiday to Romania. We are both from England and I wanted to know how the country that beat us 4-2 in the U21 European football looked like. She did some googling and found out Cluj-Napoca would be nice since we didn't want to go to the capital because she thought it was so cliché. I didn't really care that much. So we left on May 24th and we were both really happy. We got on the plane and we left to Romania. Yay. On our way there... Nothing special happened except I'm frightened by planes because I'm scared of heights. I know, sometimes I can be a pussy, but I'm just not that plane guy. So it took us four hours to get there, and we arrived at the Avramayanko airport. All nice and good. I helped my wife take the luggage, and we went searching for a motel or something. We took an Uber, and we went to the west of the city as there were cheaper motels from what I heard from the locals. City was great. Nice people, nice buildings and nice everything. My wife was so excited I almost thought she was gonna explode in it. We didn't know Romanian, but we hoped they would know English. Heh. <laughs> we arrived at the motel and to be honest, it was pretty shitty but at least I had a pillow to put my head on and it was actually very cheap. So, it worked for us. We went to this history museum but I don't think you guys care about that. So, one night, I think it was 4 a.m., I just woke up randomly. I don't know why till this day, but I know I just couldn't get myself to sleep again. I said bloody hell and just go outside, take a cig. I saw there was a guy at a vending machine and went to him. Maybe chat a little. I figured he probably wouldn't know English but went for it anyways. Hey, what's up? I looked at him. He was wearing a white hoodie and a cap. I'm gonna be honest, I thought he was some drug dealer or something but I wanted to talk to someone and my wife doesn't like it when I wake her up. Hello, I'm good, how about you? He told me as he got his fresh and cold Pepsi from the vending machine. I was surprised he knew English. Most of the people we've come across had a hard time understanding us. Guess these folks from Romania don't speak very good English. Anyways... Maybe it's just because we only talk to grown-up men, not with some random teenagers. And this guy looked like 40-plus, so it was nice seeing him he knows how to talk. Oh, finally, I thought nobody knows how to speak properly in this city, haha. I glanced at his Pepsi. Well, you were probably talking to some old motherfuckers, man. What are you doing up this late? He asked me. Nothing, just thought I can get some fresh air. I took some money from my pocket and got myself a Pepsi 2 from that vending. Where are you from? 
He asked me with a grin on his face. I'm from London, mate. I'm on holiday here. I didn't tell him I was with my wife or something. Guy was friendly but didn't look like he was friendly. Oh, London. London. I know. I've been there with work. Anyways, gotta go. He told me as he rushed into an alley. Figured he was some kind of a hobo. I stood there drinking my Pepsi when I heard a loud growl from the alley. I shook. That was no dog growl. It was so loud I think everybody heard it. That hobo couldn't growl like that. I thought to myself, what was he doing? I heard a scream and I knew shit went off. At first I didn't know what to do. I was scared. What that could be? A bear? A wolf? A lion? A tiger? What the fuck? So I said fuck it and went to the alley. What I saw wasn't human, neither animal. It was some kind of a creature, big and muscular. It had his hand in the dumpster, and it was so dark I didn't see the guy, but I figured that thing must have killed him. It ran away on all fours at supernatural speed. I sat there like an idiot trying to convince myself it wasn't real. It's a hallucination, or it's a dream. I went into the alley, I know. Stupid idea and I got my phone out. I put on the flashlight and looked into the dumpster. It smelt really, really bad. What I saw will haunt me forever and ever. It was the hobo's head with claw marks on it. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.